here's the thing. When I was in high school, <clears throat> a girl that had a crush on me put me on a kill list when I didn't reciprocate those feelings. I was number four, which, let's be honest, hurt. That hurt. Number four? <laughs> number four. I, I, I wasn't even in the top three? Come on. What the fuck? Right? It must have not been that great of a crush. But look, the school administrators found out about it, and they suspended her from school and ensured that she got psychiatric care. When a 15-year-old has a kill list, she's removed from society. When a president has one, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I, don't, I think that's not just an insult to what the prize represents, but all of the words in Nobel Peace <laughs> Prize. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, you might notice some laughter in this episode, some laughter coming in in the backdrop, some people talking uh, from, from, from the shadows, so it might seem. Uh, but that's because this was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. That's right. It was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. I do uh, weekly Zoom, almost weekly Zoom shows uh, called The Citizen revolution and then they become episodes of Forkful of Noodles that you're watching right now. So if you want to be a part of the live virtual audience, you can totally do that. You totally have the opportunity to do that. Uh, it's super fun. We get to have a Q&A and a discussion at the very end of it. Uh, and uh, I get to meet you guys and hang out with you guys and talk to you guys. So if you want to be a part of that experience, you can grab your tickets right now. And uh, as a special treat, if you become a sustaining member, you get free tickets to these live virtual stand-up comedy shows that happen almost every single Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So make sure you grab those tickets. You can go to my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, and lastly, I want to say that uh, we uh, were able to raise some money to help the folks at uh, Action for Assange uh, to get down to D.C. to cover this trial. So if you want to continue helping them out, check them out at Action for Assange. Uh, make sure you donate to them. Make sure you help them uh, give you guys the, the accurate news when it comes to Julian Assange. So uh, without any further ado, let's dive into this. But since, uh, since the Espionage Act was kept in place by the courts, it got a chance to grow up. Right along the way, 52 Americans were convicted under the Espionage Act. And it wasn't uh, just targeting peaceniks and socialists anymore. It was pushing the Red Scare and helping pave the way for McCarthyism 2.0. Now, McCarthyism Prime was happening all through the late 1800s and early 1900s with the smearing of uh, the labor movement, which was driven by Eugene Debs, Mother Jones, the International Workers of the Word, and they were being dubbed as anti-freedom commie bastards, right? Anybody who was motivated by greed looked at them as a threat to their bottom line. So the Espionage Act, Act aided in this Red Scare. Now, McCarthyism 2.0, reinforced by the Espionage Act, was going after anyone they believed was treasonous. You know, like average citizens, like Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who were given the death penalty for, being, for having suspected ties to communist Russia. Yeah. Well, it's really nice to see a piece of authoritarianism graduate from like a fine and jail time to just straight up murder, isn't it? It's just fun. It's just nice, you know? They just... Oh, so they just proud grow, of them. They just so grow up so fast, you guys. They just grow up so fast. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, it's just, oh, one day they're just like jailing socialists and the next day they're murdering regular citizens without concrete evidence. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 
I'm so sorry. You guys. I'm so sorry, you guys. It's how do I? Fascism makes me emotional. It just hits you right there. It just hits you right there. But look, over the course of the last 40 to 50 years, the Espionage Act has been a key factor in discriminating against whistleblowers who reveal America's corporate war crimes, right? The Espionage Act at this point should just be called the Kill the Messengers Initiative or Operation Fuck Your Mailman. <laughs> Which, by the way, that second one is some of our fantasies and the name of a really fun porno. I highly recommend it. Now, in 1971, a former military analyst working for the Rand Corporation, Daniel Ellsberg, revealed the Pentagon Papers. It's very important to note that he didn't sell the Pentagon Papers to the Chinese or the Vietnamese or Russian intelligence. He freely gave them over to the New York Times. The Times then publish portions of the 7,000-page document. With the Pentagon Papers, 7,000 pages, each yep. stamp top secret, revealed that for the 23-year period from 45 to 68, uh, president after president, four in that, in that telling, uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, had systematically lied to the public every time they spoke about policy in Vietnam, about what the prospects were, why we were there, what the costs were and were likely to be, both the human costs and the material costs. Uh, every aspect of it was concealed from the Congress and the public by lies and by secrecy and by uh, um, silence of people in it, which had included me for years. I'd been involved in Vietnam policy from 64 on. And he doesn't really talk about this in the interview, but the Pentagon Papers did also reveal uh, that President Lyndon B. Johnson was the only president out of all four presidents mentioned in the Pentagon Paper that did not wear pants during his meetings about Vietnam. <laughs> Good man. Good man. Good man. Good man. <laughs> it's 102 degrees here. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, you got to... Yeah, the hey, the man did what he needed to do, you know? That, that's what that's what Lyndon B. Johnson was known for. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Despite not being mentioned in the Pentagon Papers, Richard Milhouse Nixon, America's premier paranoid president, uh, decided that he had to take Ellsberg down. At this point, Daniel Ellsberg was looking at 115 years in prison under the Espionage Act. I mean, is it just me, or do you guys feel like authoritarians don't realize that human beings don't live that long? <laughs> <laughs> They're going by average lifespan with adrenochrome. That's what they're going by. <laughs> they're going by immortality life forms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But let's just, let's just even say like some humans did live that long, right? Let's say that you had a centennial human in prison. Wouldn't that just be the abject definition of elder abuse? <laughs> Weren't we yeah. taught to respect our elders? And I feel like putting them in prison, not really respecting them. Not really showing them a whole lot of respect. <laughs> now, Here's the, thing. Here's the problem with Richard Nixon. He made a critical error when he hired a bunch of goons, the same goons that he would use uh, in the Watergate scandal later uh, at the end of his presidency to break into Ellsberg's doctor's office to find dirt on him. And when they were caught, it led to a mistrial and Ellsberg's eventual freedom. When he heard that it had been revealed and was supposed to be revealed in court, uh, that my former psychoanalyst had, been, had his office burglarized by agents of the White House. Uh, they were seeking information to get me to shut up, blackmail me into silence about what I knew about the ongoing campaign and the plans for renewed, for continued bombing. Uh, it took still uh, another month for my trial to end because uh, Nixon kept the attorney general and the acting criminal, the head of the criminal division from revealing to the court what had been revealed to them by John Dean, 
that my doctor's office had been broken into. And finally, they said they were in obstruction of justice, if you a familiar term, right? It's going on right now, including involving the president. And say they went to him and said they would have to resign, lest they be subject to trial themselves for obstruction of justice, for not giving this information to the court. Look, I want to put this on the record. Okay, say what you will about Richard Nixon, but that man was consistent at being a crook. I mean, you gotta give him <laughs> you gotta give him credit for that. Here's the thing. Like, Nixon could have made himself look really, really good at the end of all this, right? War criminal Henry Kissinger, uh, he pointed out that this could be spun as the Democrats' war, and it gave them an opportunity to pull out of Vietnam. The war was still going on under a new president, uh, Richard Nixon, who was not featured in at all in the Pentagon Papers. He wasn't incriminated by it. In fact, on this day, June 13th, when they began coming up, Henry Kissinger's uh, first reaction in speaking to the president as his national security advisor said, uh, this actually helps us a little bit because it shows it's a Democrats' war, which was, was true, uh, and that the Democrats had mucked it up. And it had been my hope, actually, that uh, if it came out early enough, uh, when I first copied it in 1969, that Richard Nixon would see the opportunity to use these very documents and say the war has been ruined by uh, years of democratic uh, mismanagement of it, and there's no choice but to get out at this point. Uh, he could say whatever he wanted about the origins of the war. He could lie and say, uh, like all the others, and say that it was a noble cause for freedom and independence. Uh, but it was not a uh, practical now to keep it going. Kill him. That's what I had hoped he would say. But instead of all that, what Richard Nixon decided to do was decrease ground troops after 100,000 American soldiers had already died and increase all of the bombings. This is pretty much, <laughs> yeah, this is very similar to how Obama handled the Middle East, right? By decreasing ground troops, but increasing drone warfare and wedding explosions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, lot more, a lot more weddings exploded at that point. Now, Ellsberg is just the first of a long list of whistleblowers that the United States government has persecuted under the Espionage Act, right? The most famous of these victims is former NSA analyst Edward Snowden, or as some folks might know, know him as a woke Joseph Gordon Levitt lookalike. That's because he played Edward Snowden in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how many people were going to actually remember that movie was actually made. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Now, Edward Snowden revealed that the United States government was co uh, collecting mass amounts of data and using our cell phones to spy on the American people as if, you know, like we were all spies. Like the United States government is basically like that one friend that thinks everybody is talking about them all the time and then freaks out on strangers at the bar, you know? Which, which just makes wing night awkward all the time for everybody. That's all it does. Now, once he found this information, Snowden freely gave the information to journalist Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept. Again, he didn't sell it to China or Russia or a fucking balding supervillain living inside a volcano. <laughs> he gave it to a journalist. I mean, this is an argument that's used against whistleblowers all the time, every single day on, on corporate media, whenever they bring up whistleblowers. Well, you know, they, they could have sold it to some kind of foreign intelligence. Yeah, but they didn't. Yeah, but they could have. Yeah, yeah, well, they fucking didn't. Yeah, but what if, oh my God, how are you a news network? <laughs> how are you a place for information? And now... Because the United States hates getting caught with its pants down, which some people believe is because the U.S. has a complex about its dick size not measuring up to the rest of the world. You know? <laughs> which really, I got to say, is why the U.S. should really start using the metric system. But this, that is a different subject for a different time. <laughs> 
But because the United States hates getting caught with his pants down, they tried to get Snowden's asylum requests denied by virtually every single European country. Right? Snowden was eventually granted asylum in Ecuador, but he had to get there from Hong Kong, which meant he had to, he had to fly through Russia. The U.S. Intelligence Service and the Obama administration knew his flight landed in Moscow when they revoked his passport, stranding him in exile in Russia. What I wasn't expecting was that the United States government itself, as you said, uh, would cancel my passport. So I'm stopped at, at passport control, and there's this, uh, you know, the standard passport officer. And um, when I go through the line, uh, he takes a little bit too long. Uh, he picks up the phone, he makes a call, uh, and I, I realize it's longer than everybody else. And suddenly he looks at me and just says, uh, there is problem with passport, <laughs> you know, uh, come with. And so I'm led very quickly into this um, business lounge. <laughs> which is very much not standard. Uh, normally, you'd be taken off to a, a security area, and I go in, and it's a, a room full of Russian guys in, in business suits. And the first thing I'm thinking about, because every alarm bell in my head is uh, ringing, is are they recording this? Are they using this to try to blackmail me, to coerce me? I mean, so immediately I go, look, uh, I worked for the CIA. I, I know what this is. I know what this, uh, how this is supposed to go. This is not going to be that kind of conversation. So you declined there the, the Russian intelligence request to cooperate then. You got stuck in the airport for 40 days. Because um, you said something very important, which was that I was trapped in that airport for 40 days. Again, for those people who might be a little bit skeptical of me, if I had cooperated with the Russian government, right, if you think I'm a Russian spy, I would have been in that airport for five minutes before they drove me out in a limo, you know, to the palace where I would be living for the rest of my days before they, you know, throw the parade where they call me a hero of uh, Russia. I applied for asylum in 27 different countries around the world, uh, places like Germany, France, Norway, that I thought the U.S. government and the American public uh, would be much more comfortable with me being there. And yet we saw something extraordinary happen, just, just one thing, which is that uh, the U.S. government worked quite hard to make sure I didn't leave Russia, to the point that they actually grounded uh, the presidential aircraft of the president of Bolivia, uh, which is like grounding Air Force One. It's something that's really unprecedented in diplomatic history. And it's very much an open question today. Um, why did the U.S. government work so hard to keep me in Russia? Basically, this gave them the opportunity to claim that he was a Russian spy. Oh, and then the NSA can finally live out their James Bond fetish. <laughs> they can finally become one of the Bond girls as an entire agency, you guys. It's a big deal. It's a big deal, right? The NSA can be transformed from the National Security Agency to the National Pussy Galore Agency. Oh, man. <laughs> It's fun, right? It's fun when dreams come true at the expense of innocent people. It's a good time, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> now, there are some people that look at someone like Edward Snowden and say, well, why can't he just come home and face the music? But if he did come home, the music would be listening to Nickelback in a jail cell for life without a fair trial. And I believe listening to Nickelback is against the Geneva Convention. So, yeah. <laughs> here's what he says about, about coming back home. I would not have uh, received a, a fair trial. Uh, there would not have been much of a trial at all. Uh, I would only have received a sentencing. And the question there is, um, what message does that send, whether you like me or not? Uh, I could be the best person in the world. I could be the worst. What message does a conviction where you spend the rest of your life in prison for telling journalists things that change the laws of the United States, uh, that have re resulted in the most substantive reforms to intelligence authorities uh, since the 1970s, uh, if the only result of doing that is a life sentence in prison, the next person who sees something criminal happening in the United States government uh, will be discouraged from coming forward, and I can't be a part of that. And that denial of trial, that denial of fair trial, was under the Obama administration, who evoked the Espionage Act more than any other president. 
right? Look, the Obama administration had every opportunity to undo this legacy of democratic authoritarianism that was left behind by their predecessors, but they didn't, right? Obama exiled Snowden and he only commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence. Manning was the U.S. Army soldier that revealed documents proving that the American military was killing Afghani civ civilians and international journalists to WikiLeaks. If Obama truly believed that these war crimes are something that the country should atone for, he would have started by completely pardoning Chelsea Manning. And thanks to Obama handing the keys to a dictator's playbook to our current president and best CIA asset, he's the best, no one's better, no one's a better puppet of the CIA, Donald Trump, uh, I have to do, legally I'm supposed to do the fingers and the hands when I mention his name. Um, but <laughs> now Donald Trump is persecuting even more whistleblowers under his regime. One of these whistleblowers is a, uh, someone by the name of Daniel Everett Hale. A former U.S. intelligence analyst was arrested Thursday and charged with violating the Espionage Act for allegedly leaking documents about the secretive U.S. drone program. 31-year-old Daniel Hale was arrested in Nashville, Tennessee. He faces up to 50 years in prison. Hale was enlisted in the Air Force from 2009 to 2013, during which he worked with the National Security Agency and the Joint Special Operations Task Force at the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, where he helped identify targets to be assassinated. He later worked as a contractor for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Hale's accused of disclosing 11 top secret or secret documents to a reporter. The indictment does not name the reporter, but unnamed government sources have told media outlets the reporter is investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept. Now, in 2015, The Intercept did put out a series of stories called The Drone Papers, which outlined how the Obama administration was using inaccurate technology and kill lists to take out people they considered, quote unquote, dangerous. Um, what we've published uh, is an extensive uh, look into how this program has operated historically, but specifically under President Obama. One of the most significant uh, uh, findings of this, and my colleague Cora Courier really dug deep into this, um, is we published for the first time the kill chain what the bureaucracy of assassination looks like. And what you see is that um, all of these officials, including people like the Treasury Secretary, are part of uh, signing off on all of this, uh, at where they have these secret meetings uh, and they discuss who's gonna live and die around the world. And at the end of that process, it is the President of the United States who signs what, what amounts to a uh, death warrant uh, for whoever they've decided should die based on what amounts to a parallel secret uh, judicial system in the United States that is not really subjected to any kind of judicial review, where the president acts sort of as emperor, issues an edict that you die. And what we show, and, and this is the first time that, that there's documentary evidence of this, is that the president gives the military a 60-day window to hunt down and kill these individuals. Uh, Ken Roth from Human Rights Watch uh, pointed out today, if the standard is that the people who are uh, being targeted uh, for assassination uh, is that they represent an imminent threat, which is what the president says the U.S. policy is, uh, then why do they have 60 days to do it? Why don't they need to do it now if it's imminent? Well, that's because they've redefined the term imminent uh, to, to, to be so vague as to not even resemble its actual commonly understood definition. So here's the thing. When I was in high school, <clears throat> a girl that had a crush on me put me on a kill list when I didn't reciprocate those feelings. I was number four, which, let's be honest, hurt. That hurt. Number four? <laughs> number I, I, I wasn't even in the top three? Come on. What the fuck? Right? It must have not been that great of a crush. But look, the school administrators found out about it and they suspended her from school and ensured that she got psychiatric care. When a 15 year old has a kill list, she's removed from society. When a president has one, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I, don't, I think that's not just an insult to what the prize represents, but all of the words in Nobel Peace <laughs> Prize. <laughs> 
Hale was arrested and indicted for revealing information to a journalist and currently faces 50 years in prison. You know who's facing zero years in prison? All of the people that had a fucking kill list and used million dollar drones to rain death from the skies. By the way, uh, Death from the Skies is also the title of the newest Steven Seagal film that's going right to VHS. VHS. Very, very exciting. <laughs> He's still alive, uh, you guys. <laughs> Just wanted to let everybody know. <laughs> but look, the, the Espionage Act protects real sociopaths and murderers, but ensures the people who had a conscience about, the, about their misdeeds face a lifetime in prison. Now, the primary reason these whistleblowers are villainized is because uh, they're calling out American war crimes, and that is deemed treasonous. So let's find out what the definition of treason actually is. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. So you have to be waging war against the nation in order to be convicted of treason. Waging war. If that's the definition of treason, then the entire Confederacy should be considered treasonous. But instead of that, we put up statues of them and fucking name streets after them. There were U.S. bankers helping the Nazis funnel money, like Prescott Bush, and we let his kids and grandkids become presidents that lead us into more wars. Right. Major U.S. corporations like the, the Rockefellers, GM, and Ford all aided the Nazis, and we hailed them as the pride of American innovation. Look, my first car was a 1996 Ford Taurus. And it was a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> that car fucking sucked. It, every, every, every week it was something new with that car. And now that I know that Ford was helping the Nazis, all of that makes sense. Build Ford tough. <laughs> Build Ford tough, just, which is basically one small way for a Nazi sympathizer to win against minorities. That's all that is. <laughs> And the obvious one that we've seen time and time again, especially in the, in the recent months, is the militarized police being unleashed on protesters asking for less militarized police and to stop murdering innocent civilians. I mean, that is basically a war on American citizens by the government. And remember, Eugene Debs said that the working class don't get to declare war or peace. Only the oligarchs get to do that. And that hasn't changed. Right? Rich politicians from fucking Trump to Pelosi to McConnell to Schumer, they've all used their militarized police to continue creating upheaval through an em emboldened and racist system. So wouldn't that make anybody that uses these cops to wage a war on our streets to be treasonous? Whistleblowers aren't treasonous. They're heroes. They're shedding light on, a gov on, on governmental misdeeds, and they shouldn't be punished for that. Said they should be rewarded for it. We should be putting authoritarian, treasonous war profiteers in prison and giving these whistleblowers the Nobel Peace Prize. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up. Give it a share and make sure people get to actually see this. Share this with your friends. Share this with your enemies. Share this with whoever you think is going to be uh, excited about uh, a content like this. If you're watching this on the, the Facebooks or the YouTubes, if that is your way that you enjoy watching uh, this show, then please make sure that you are subscribed. Please make sure that you hit the bell to get notifications about new videos that I'll be dropping. Uh, I drop videos every single week on this channel. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version, please subscribe there and write us a review. And if you're on Rockfin, thank you for watching this show on Rockfin. Rockfin is a uh, crypto blockchain uh, content producer friendly uh, platform. 
it's like the Netflix for uh, co uh, content producers, especially if you like political commentary content like Graham Elwood and Ron Cone, Jimmy Dore, Kim Iverson, Nico House, Convo Couch, uh, Richard Mendhurst, a ton of other people are on Rockfin. And if you, uh, if you subscribe, it's $10 a month. You get access to all of the premium content that is not just available on my channel, but on every single person on Rockfin's channel. So you can go uh, check my Rockfin channel out at rockfin.com slash Mohan ha ha. Uh, for show dates to make donations, check out past videos, past podcasts uh, to, to, to see what press interviews I've done. Uh, you can go directly to my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, thank you to all the people that have already become patrons, already become subscribers, continue to come out to these uh, live virtual comedy shows. Uh, it means a lot, and I really appreciate you guys. Uh, but till next week, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you on the road.